So it's kind of unbelievable to see how much the people were willing to believe in this fake psychic that James Randi created, right? The idea that when he was revealed to be the fake that he was, that people were saying to him, I know what they're saying about you, but I still believe. I know that you're the real thing. And he's like, no, I'm not. No, I, no, no, I believe it. Uh, people want these things to be true. And so they will um, perceive you know, relationships between things that aren't there, but that suit their expectations or their, their wants. So when we look at psychic predictions, if we want to look at them objectively, we want to have this little grid pattern, right? So we have on the left, was the event predicted? Yes or no. And then at the top, did the event occur? Yes or no. What we would like to see is that if they predicted the event, it actually occurs. If they didn't predict the event, it doesn't occur, right? And that, those are the things that um, we look for in psychic predictions. But you know what would be really super informative is if they predicted the event and it never occurred. How many mass suicides have been at the behest of someone predicting that you know, the hale bop comet is going to usher us to the next world, or this is the day that the world's going to end and you'll go to heaven if you commit suicide today and other really insidiously bad things. And as we all sit here and the world has not ended, we can attest that the event did not occur, right? So they predict an event and it didn't occur. A lot of times those misses are overlooked, by people. And of course, in the cases that I gave you, obviously, they aren't observed by the people who had believed them. It's weird, though, because all of us who observe those things going wrong, you know, the end is near, and then it doesn't end. And we see that it was wrong, it doesn't necessarily inoculate us to um, the next person who might come along with an equally outlandish claim, right, predicting something's going to happen in the future, and they really have no way of knowing that and um, stuff like that. Psychics should be measured by how often they predict something that doesn't come true or how often they fail to predict something that does actually end up happening. Like those are the important um, metrics of the psychic skill, not did they predict something and it came true. That's what they do with those. If you guys have ever seen Nostradamus, um, he wrote these really opaque quatrains, they call them, and they're... um, He wrote them in French. They try and translate them. He wrote them back in like the 1200s or something. And um, now in hindsight, people are using those quatrains to predict 9-11, for example, or World War II, or the rise of Hitler, um, because he wrote something, he wrote somebody's name called Hister. So they're like, wow, that's pretty close to Hitler. Um, You know, he he said that um, a fire would burn in the... um, in the new kingdom or something they're like new kingdom that's new york and look at the fire burning he predicted it in retrospect a lot of predictions can be lined up with what has actually come to pass what's much more important is to do that hypothesis testing that we talk about in this class right make your prediction and then let's see whether it comes true or not right that is much more informative so but a lot of times we focus on those hits because we want it to be true A lot of times we focus on the hits because some events are what we call one-sided. Those one-sided events encourage us to notice the hits. Um, By encourage, I mean that one outcome is more noticeable than the other outcome. Two-sided events would be different, but in, in the case of, for example, you just washed your car and then it rained, Raining after you just washed your car is much more noticeable than it not raining after you wash your car or it raining on your dirty car. Like those aren't very noticeable. I just washed my car and now it's raining on it. That's noticeable. So that's what we would call a one-sided event. Or, you know, you just got in the shower and then the phone rings. Like that's much more noticeable than all the times that your phone rings when you're not in the shower or all the showers you took and no, no phone rang. Um, Or, you know, you're in a hurry, you're running to go get to the elevator and it's leaving just as you get there. That's much more noticeable than the times that you've walked into an open waiting elevator or the times that the elevator was nowhere to be seen when you arrived, right? Like those one-sided events 
attract our attention to certain events, right? The two-sided event, both outcomes would be equally noticeable. And those kinds of two-sided events are much less likely to develop illusory correlations in our minds, right? Because either way um, is equally noticeable. And so we're not going to think that we somehow caused it or that these two things, the fact that I was in a hurry is what caused the elevator be, to be leaving while I arrived, right? We don't make those kinds of incorrect assessments in two-sided experiences as often as we do with one-sided. Another reason why we form illusory correlations is that sometimes we fail to notice all the relevant information. You know, as we move through the world, we notice the things we notice and we, as far as our memories are concerned, um, if we didn't notice it, it never happened, right? So sometimes we just don't notice stuff that would be really relevant to us understanding how the world's actually working. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of that. Um, the first one is a study of cats in New York City that had fallen um, from a, an apartment window. Um, some of the falls were as, as low as two stories. The highest fall was 32 stories. 132 cats were taken to the vet after they fell. Um, 17 were euthanized without any kind of treatment. They, it was clear that they weren't going to survive. 11 were treated, but they ultimately died of their injuries and 104 survived. So we have 104 of 132 cats surviving. And actually this is a graphic from the um, study. And what was interesting to the, to the researchers is that the injuries increased with the number of stories fallen up to a point and then the injuries actually went down with the high, like the nine stories and above. So see those curves, right? Um, thoracic injuries are to the body. Fractures are the um, solid line there with the circles. Um, split palates, that sounds horrible. Their little faces hit the floor. This is horrible. And then we have total injuries in the top. You know, if you accumulate all kinds of injuries together. So they were really kind of interested and perplexed by why the, um, the, the injuries accumulated up to about, you know, eight stories tall, and then they seem to decline. Total injuries declined for the nine and nine to 32 stories. So people read the story, read the, read the study, and then they had all sorts of um, explanations for this amazing survival rate and this, um, especially this curve for why they got less injured with the higher falls. So they would point to things like the laws of physics, like maybe they were somehow decelerating their velocity through, you know, waving their tails or, or something. Um, maybe it's because of their superior balance, the fact that they can always land on their legs, they can use their legs like little pistons to sort of cushion and, you know, bend their knees and, and shoulders and sort of um, not have like a, a breaking kind of experience with the ground. Instead, they sort of, you know, collapse into it. And um, finally, we have this flying squirrel tactic where they were suggesting that in addition to maybe that swirling tail and stuff like that, that maybe they were able to slow their descent by, um, you know, having their four legs out and maybe their skin stretched a little bit out, sort of like a flying squirrel does. So there were all these explanations of, um, you know, why we're seeing this really, you know, 104 out of 132 cats surviving the fall. And it all sounds like we're having the correct conversation until I'd like to point something out. <laughs> uh, would you take your cat to the vet if it died in the fall? Hmm. Probably not. Right? Like if the cat was clearly dead, why would you take it to the vet? So of the 130 cats that were taken to a vet is what this should say, right? Well, it does say it. 132 cats were taken to a vet, but it should say of the 132 who were taken to the vet, we have no idea how many cats actually fall from any of these heights because who reports that their cat fell out of a window and died? I mean, there's no like registry for that. So we have no idea how many cats in New York City die falling from an apartment window every year or whatever. So all we're seeing are the cats who had the best chance of survival because their humans bundled them up and took them to the vet. Right? So it may not be any of these amazing survival explanations. It could be. I mean, it's possible that the cats, one thing we do know is that when you weigh less, 
you know, the terminal velocity isn't going to be as great for you as you get to the bottom. And there are some things that are probably true that cats have a better chance of surviving that than like a human would. And in fact, in the study, one of the things they did was they compared cats to humans. And that's not really a apples to apples kind of com comparison, is it? Um, so they probably do have some, you know, laws of physics on their side and superior balance and flying squirrel tactic might come into play. But we also have to remember that we're only focusing on the cats that were taken to the vet. We're ignoring the potential thousands of cats who don't get taken to the vet. What about another circumstance? NASA, oh man, I feel bad talking about this because tomorrow um, they're launching the SpaceX rocket to take our astronauts out to the space station. So I feel almost like I'm jinxing them, not to think in magical thoughts, but okay, I have to go on though, right? NASA had to decide whether to launch the Space Shuttle Challenger back in 1986 um, because they normally, you know, they launch out of uh, Florida where very rarely are the temperatures below freezing or below 60, right? I mean, it's warm there. So they were making the decision on the morning of the flight to decide whether they should launch, launch the space shuttle. I think the temperature that day was, I think it was 38 degrees. And so they're like, is it dangerous for us to be launching at such a cold temperature? So they looked at all the failures that they had ever had and saw that they happened just as often at the higher temperatures, right? Like the lowest temperature that they had a failure at was 53. And, but look how many more failures occurred at, you know, 60 degrees or warmer, right? Like there are more at 60 degrees or warmer than there are at cooler than that. So they're like, I don't think temperature matters. And so um, they went ahead and launched. Here's a nice um, graphic depiction, a scatter plot of those points. And you see, you know, we've got some failures, um, you know, at 50 degrees and what is that? 53 degrees. And then we have a lot of failures that are warmer. So they were like, well, I don't think temperature matters. So they launched. And as we can see, that did not go well. So after the fact, they said, how could we have, how could we have made such a bad decision? And they made the bad decision because they failed to take all of the relevant information into account. So here's a table that shows all the different launches that they've had. First thing to notice, they have never launched at a temperature that was cooler than 53 degrees. Like that should have been a big red flag that we're trying to launch at, you know, 15 degrees cooler than we've ever done before. Um, and if you put the zeros into the, um, into the column where you see that there's never been a failure at these different temperatures, where, so they, they launched at 66 degrees, you know, at least once, if not more, and never had a failure. That's what those zeros are representing. And so what you see is that they have mostly launched at much warmer than 38 degrees. Um, and that they uh, actually, now that you look at it, it does look like the accidents are clustering at the cooler temperatures, right? And if we look at the scatter plot, you see that it kind of looks like the failures are clustering towards the cooler end of the time, the temperatures that they have launched, right? They, they mostly launch when it's warmer. So after the fact, they realized I think temperature did matter. And it did matter because it turned out that the O-ring that allowed the, the fuel to leak out had frozen and it cracked. And so they had they looked at all the data that you're seeing in front of you and realized the pattern, they would have, you know, delayed the launch. And so, um, you know, this tendency to not notice all relevant information, it happens in lots of circumstances. It, I mean, this was clearly a high stakes life and death situation, and they still kind of picked and chose which data to look at and kind of to confirm their pre-existing belief that it was safe to, to launch. So it's a natural tendency to not notice all relevant information. And it's a, a natural tendency that can con contribute to the formation of illusory correlations. All right. So another reason why we form illusory correlations is something that we call odd matches. Something that will attract our attention is when something happens that is odd or that we don't expect. Like, for example, when lightning does strike the same place twice, it really catches our attention. We're like, wait, I thought lightning never strikes twice. This is odd. I didn't expect this. So I have a little video to illustrate that it really does strike twice. 
So uh, the next item in your playlist, actually we can watch this one because it doesn't matter if you can hear it. So and in fact, you might like it better if you can't hear it. There it goes once. And our, our videographer said, boom, oh, and there, same exact place. Struck it again. Literally, lightning does strike twice. I don't know where that whole uh, phrase ever came from. Lightning doesn't strike twice. Uh, because literally, the same places get struck by lightning over and over and over again. There are just certain places that are more lightning prone. Um, so yes, lightning strikes twice. Um, what about lightning striking twice in the form of winning the lottery twice from the same store? Hmm, is that possible? I'm going to say it is because look at the title. Um, but it's, it's the kind of thing that catches our attention. So check out this story. And actually what you'll hear is that more than one person has won twice from this store. 